Do you guys remember the board game Monopoly? You know, the game where you're going around the board, playing with money, buying property, building houses. I don't even know why I'm explaining this. Everybody knows Monopoly. Well, when I was a kid, I was an incredible Monopoly player. I mean, like, the absolute best. It did not matter who I was playing with. I could be playing with my sister, my friends, adults, anybody. And when I would play, I would win. And don't get this one twisted. It's not like I was cheating. It's not like I was playing unfairly and doing things that were shady. I wasn't stealing from the bank. I wasn't cheating with the dice. I was playing 100% by the rules. And I would always win. Now, you might be hearing me say all this and wonder, like, what was my secret? What was I doing? How did I pull this one off? Was I just really a lucky kid? Did I have some sort of mathematical ability to calculate all the probabilities in my head and always made the right choice? And to be quite honest, it was actually none of those things. I just had a comprehensive understanding of all of the rules of Monopoly and how to use those rules of Monopoly to ensure that I would always win. The rules of Monopoly guided my strategy, which guided how I played, and that was my secret. That was how I always won. Now I'm sure you're probably hearing me say all of this and you're wondering what is it? What was my secret? How did I win? And well, my friends, don't worry, I've got you covered. So the way that it would work is I would start the game and I would try to buy up as much property as possible, which as you guys know is kind of the point of the game and so there's nothing unusual about that. But what I would do is I would work to try to secure as quickly as possible the cheapest monopolies. And when I'm saying the cheapest monopolies, I'm talking about the dark purples, the light blues, the light purples, and maybe if I was feeling lucky, I might test my luck and try to win the oranges. It kind of all depended on, on where you'd land initially and what, what properties other people would have. But my goal was to always buy as many of those cheap properties as possible so that I could ultimately get monopolies very, very quickly and have them be cheap enough that I can quickly develop them as well. You wanna trade Boardwalk for Oriental and St. James? You wanna do a swap of Baltic and Connecticut? I got you covered. Usually, especially if people were playing with me for the first time, they would kind of scratch their head and, and be somewhat confused by all of this. Like, you know, the usual instinct that somebody has when they're playing Monopoly is, you wanna get the expensive ones. You want those hotels on Boardwalk. But no, 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 not me, my friends. I did not want that. I wanted the cheap properties, I wanted cheap monopolies, and I wanted them as quick as possible because I had a plan in a structured way that I would win the games. You see, as soon as I would have these cheap monopolies in the cheap part of town on the Monopoly board, what I would then start doing is immediately buying as many houses as I possibly could. I would make myself broke. I would mortgage all of the properties that I owned that weren't involved in these low rent monopolies. My goal was just to buy as many houses as humanly as possible as quickly as possible. You see, because a lot of people don't quite realize that houses are the secret to monopoly. You see, some people think that hotels are the important thing. You know, again, back to that vision that everybody has of playing Monopoly and owning Boardwalk with a hotel and having somebody land on it and owing them a lot of money. You know, that's often how people thought they were gonna win Monopoly, but not me, not me as a little 10 year old kid, because I knew that the rules of Monopoly dictated something very specific. And that specific thing is that there's a limited number of houses you can actually own in Monopoly. And ye who controls the supply of houses controls the game of Monopoly. And you can't build hotels in Monopoly if you don't already have houses on that property. And so in my race to go purchase as many of the houses as possible, what I was essentially doing was constricting the supply of houses that would be available. And so the other players I would be playing with would oftentimes build up their monopolies in the more expensive part of the board and their monopolies would cost more money to purchase more houses, and so they wouldn't develop nearly as quickly as I would. You know, for example, a house on Connecticut Avenue only costs $50, while a house on Park Place costs $200. So even if one of my competitors managed to grab a monopoly, as well as grab a house or two, and develop that monopoly, they would never be able to develop to the point where they'd be able to charge me significant money. And meanwhile, I had this whole strip of monopolies in the low rent side of the board, 
which has a higher probability of having people land on the pieces. And at that point in the game, the people I was playing with would always sort of realize what had just happened. And then it would just become a game of attrition where I would grind them down slowly but surely until I had taken control of the entire board and I had won the game. Now you might be watching this video and wondering why I'm telling you a story about how awful of a kid I was growing up and the horrible things I would do to other people when I played Monopoly. I feel like it relates to the thing I wanna to talk to you all about today. Because you see, I've been driving in that rental car now for the last, I don't know, I left the house at six o'clock, took about an hour to get the rental car. It's about one o'clock right now. So I'll call it about six hours of driving and windshield time. And I've been thinking a lot about a dilemma that I have here on the farm. Not here on the farm because I'm clearly not on my farm. But a dilemma I'm facing nonetheless related to the farm and the farm business. You see, as a lot of you know, I've been working to start a new company, a beef jerky company, with really the vision being that I raise cattle on my farm, I harvest them for their beef, I then convert that beef into jerky, and then I'm able to sell it all across the country to the folks who watch our YouTube videos and TikTok videos and Facebook videos and such. Like very specifically, that has been my plan and I've been working towards it for, gosh, almost about a year now. You know, I hatched the concept last winter. I took the steps that I needed to buy the cattle and be ready for the cattle. I took the steps that I needed to learn how to make jerky and make biltong and develop recipes that would taste really good and that people would really like. I booked space with a local slaughterhouse so that I could get my animal processed in a USDA inspected facility. Like I felt like I was doing everything right, but I've since hit a USDA roadblock and I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get past it. So just as a quick, maybe 60 second primer for those of you not familiar with the laws around meat processing and handling in the United States, the way it works is you have to have a facility that's inspected by uh, USDA representatives. It has to meet certain health code standards. There has to be certain health procedures in place. They do audits, they do checking, they do monitoring. Sometimes they have people actually on site, like it's a whole thing. But then at the same time, there's certain exemptions and exceptions. For example, in most states, they also have what's known as state inspected facilities. So like in the state of Vermont, there are state inspected facilities where you can process an animal and you can do everything you need to package it and get it ready for sale, retail sale. But the restriction that you're gonna be faced with is that you can't bring that product across state lines. So even though I might have raised the animal, say 10 minutes from New Hampshire, which is about how far I live from the New Hampshire state line, if I got my beef processed at a state inspected facility, I could only ever sell it in Vermont. I can't bring it across the Connecticut River into New Hampshire, that would be illegal. Now I'm apparently standing in a street corner in Pennsylvania, and that right behind me is the Delaware River. And on the other side of the Delaware River over there, I believe is New York. And so if I had an animal that was slaughtered here, I couldn't bring it over there and sell it. And I'm not exactly familiar with the laws in New York or Pennsylvania, so I'm sure people will clarify some things in the comments for me. But I think you guys get the principle, right? The idea that if the animal is slaughtered at a state inspected facility, it can't be brought across state lines, however simple that state line might seem to be. And in a lot of ways, those rules are actually really important for the protection of the consumer. Those rules ensure that proper safety guidelines are observed and that all steps are being taken to ensure that the consumer is not getting unsafe product. And believe me, I've read Upton St. Clair's The Jungle I know the horrible situation of meatpacking in America over the last 150 plus years. There's good reasons that we have rules like this. But that said, as I get into the meat business or deeper into the meat business, I'm starting to realize that I'm facing certain issues that speak to the complexity of this situation. You see, even though I have a USDA inspected processor all lined up for my butcher date, and even though I have the capital in hand that I need to purchase the equipment necessary to make the jerky and biltong, I currently lack a place to do the work that is USDA inspected. Because the way it works is the packaging of meat that I get from the USDA inspector 
It comes specially wrapped and sealed and marked as USDA inspected meat. But then as soon as I take that meat and open up the packaging, it's no longer USDA inspected and I no longer can sell it to a consumer and I can no longer sell it across state lines. And even though I can actually line up commercial kitchen space, I can't find USDA inspected space that I can use for the work. I don't know, is this now all coming into focus for you guys? Like, are you getting it? So simply stated, the dilemma I have is I have nowhere to make my beef jerky. The processor I plan to use in the fall, who by the way, have been great people to work with so far, they are so busy right now. The idea of even letting me rent space from them to do the processing myself is like completely a non-starter for them. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but meat processors all across the country are just slammed from a capacity standpoint. And while the vast, vast, vast majority of American meat is processed by like four companies, it's a pretty crazy monopoly they got going there. Or I guess technically it'd be a quadopoly. I think that for me is at the root of the dilemma. But that said, within the region that I live in, there still are a handful of USDA inspected facilities that are considered kind of small facilities. I don't know if you guys know this, but my friend Olivia, who actually lives out in Indiana and runs a farm called Sean Troop Farm, she's actually been helping me out and getting this project going. We've been reaching out to pretty much every processor in the greater northern New England area. And everybody is in the same situation as my processor that I already have a date booked with. Everybody is super busy. They don't have enough labor. They're over capacity in terms of the number of slaughter dates they have booked. And they have no interest in some dude like me setting up in their back room and potentially setting their USDA approvals at risk by the operation I'm trying to get started up. And now there are a couple of larger jerky manufacturers I might be able to work with. And what they'd let me do is like label my product as being from my farm, but I would have to follow specific recipes that they have and do everything that they'd want me to do, which I don't know, maybe I will still end up doing because that might be my best available option. But at the same time, I'm still struggling with what to do. You know, I have been working with the local USDA office. I have been working with um, the, the Department of Agriculture in Vermont. Anson Tebitz, who's the secretary, as well as his entire team, they have been awesome. And given that I'm a guy who's had issues with other state departments in Vermont, <coughs> fish and wildlife, <coughs> it's been very refreshing to experience that. I know, I keep forgetting to take you guys with me, sorry. You know, I hope my spiel yesterday doesn't really come off as whining to you guys. This is just me thinking out loud as I go through this process of trying to pull together and start a new business and do something that frankly I've never done before. And I'm learning a lot and I'm trying to share those things that I'm learning with all of you and letting you have this chance of actually seeing this business get built from the ground up. That is, of course, assuming that I can build a business. And believe me, there's no delusion in my mind to say that I think USDA regulations are gonna change in the next 12 months or 24 months just because I started whining about it. I'm just processing all of this that I'm learning with you guys and sharing it out loud. As I look at what my options are for what I do next, I don't know, I feel like I have a couple of different directions I can go in. I think number one is I can just focus on selling cuts of meat and I can maybe freeze it and ship it, which I don't really like. I can maybe just focus on selling in the local area, which I think I like a little bit better than the idea of having to ship frozen meat. I could continue to grow and hopefully find somebody who's ultimately interested in working with me on a beef jerky business. I could maybe find a partner and they could probably uh, help me kind of try to get things going and, and have the patience to navigate setting up a new either meat packaging facility or a meat slaughterhouse that could do from end to end from, you know, a live animal coming in on hoof to, you know, walking out the door as a bag of beef jerky. So those are all definitely options that are available to me. But honestly, I, I don't quite know yet. I think um, it does show I probably could have done a better job researching all the rules and regulations before I started moving too much quicker into all this. 
but I don't feel like I really jumped too far ahead of myself because I always wanted cattle, whether it meant beef jerky or not. I think just these quirks that I'm discovering right now around the rules and regulations make me have to think a little bit differently about how I'm gonna approach things. So I'm now on day two of driving, and uh, man, it's some, I don't know, I think I'm somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> Where am I? I don't even know what state I'm in at this point. <laughs> but I'm driving still. It's been a lot of time to think. It's been a lot of time to, to try to make a plan for where I go next and what I do next. And I gotta admit, because I'm flying solo on this trip, or at least this part of this trip, having you guys to talk to you and, and be able to think some of this through live is really helpful. And again, I'm sure you're wondering where I'm going. Um, and you'll find out soon enough. Uh, probably in the next video I put out, you'll get some answers there. Yeah, I got a lot of thinking to do.